just recapping, our title is Beat Internationalism. And building on that and the work of the last couple of days, um, to the papers today should consider or will be considering issues of cultural translation in the context of political dissent, um, with a focus on how the understanding of beat internationally is often based on cultural assumptions about the US, with beat sensibilities and aesthetics then filtered through a wide set of national, cultural and literary conventions and contexts. What does the translation of the canon, if such a thing exists, of beat literature uh, do to conceptions of beat? Does the reinscription or translation or misappropriation of beat tropes in new media forms constitute a similar filtering or translation? Uh, and ultimately, what does this all mean for the contemporary social and literary relevance of beat? And what does this all mean for us as beat scholars at institutions increasingly hostile to the liberal arts? Why do we see the beats, influenced as they were by many non-American sources, as important to a vaguely delineated international countercultural literature? Um, and also, were they exiles, migrants, members of a diaspora, or just simply American? And are we ultimately being American-centric here? Okay, so first up today is Estibalitz Encarnacion Pinado, who's currently lecturing at the Polytechnic University of Cartagena in Spain. She specializes in gender and feminist discourses in post-war and avant-garde American poetry. Her research focuses on the poetry and art of poets such as Anne Waldman, Ruth Weiss, Joanne Kager, and Diane de Prima. Recent publications include Shifting the Mythic Discourse, Ambiguity and Destabilization in Joan Kiger's The Tapestry and the Web, um, Intertextuality in Diane de Prima's Loba, Religious Discourse and Feminism, uh, and Beat Affinity in Spanish Poetry. Oh, sorry, that's the... My glasses are gone. Ah, that's your PPT come up. That's what's putting me off. <laughs> uh, and Femme, La Beat Generation Revisité, uh, in Beat Generation 2018. She's also the co-editor, and I'm proud to say I'm part of this too, of Ruth Weiss Beat Poetry, Jazz and Art uh, that's, come, that's forthcoming. Away you go, Estibalitz. Thank you. Uh, you blew my mind with all those questions before my presentation. <laughs> but okay, I'll do just, my best. Just ignore them. We'll come, <laughs> come back later if necessary. <laughs> all right. Um, okay, yeah, so uh, hello, good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the influence uh, of the big generation in Spanish poetry. And I'm going to mostly concentrate on contemporary poets. But before I do this, I'd like to very briefly talk about Clara Boya, uh, Skylights. Let me do this. Um, and this is a literary magazine and, and it represents uh, one of the earliest and most influential points of entrance of the big generation in, Sp in a Spain that was still under Franco's dictatorship by that time. In 1967, the literary magazine published as a 14th issue, a special number dedicated to be poetry that included translations of, as you can see on screen, uh, among many others, uh, Allen, Allen Ginsberg, Hal Fukar, Hal Fukar, Solomon, Lawrence Farighetti, Akani Island of the Mind, Jack Harrock's Mexico City Blues, and Gregory Corso's Cello. Uh, On the one hand, the explicitly literary approach adopted in Clara Goya stands in sharp contrast, uh, contrast with the more sensationalized pieces of news that were reached in Spain through weekly magazines such as Triunfo, Triumph, uh, where you have features like Bigness Rally, the Sign of Bigness, and Bigness uh, in Madrid, that chronicle, and this is a, a quote from the magazine, the spread of travel makers of unkempt and even miserable appearance, uh, such as these people here. So these are the beatniks that were rich in Spain at that time. And of course, they were using a superficial and rather diminish, diminishing fashion that is very reminiscent of Hatterets and O'Neill's often quoted critiques, the know nothing Bohemians, and the only rebellion around. So this is basically the first news we got of the beat generation, not really through beat poets, but through beatniks. On the other hand, Clara Boya's issue on beat poetry also represented an improvement in relation to the visibility the monograph offered in contrast with early pieces of news that were reached in Spain in the 60s. And these were mostly through Corrales Egea's Letters from Paris, 
uh, and this is a section he wrote for the literary magazine Insula. However serious or frivolous the approach, these first beat contacts were an indirect consequence of the political and economic changes that were taking place in Spain during the 60s. This new period in Francois Spain translated into an economic, economic liberalism, a slight policy of liberalization and a willingness, willingness to get closer to Europe. So it's actually through Europe that we get closer to the beat generation, not necessarily through the US. And this prompted not only the infiltration of the beatnik into Spain's popular culture, but also a more serious connection with the beat generation on literary and ideological terms. In about Allen Ginsberg and the beat generation, and this is a, a, an essay included in Claragoya, the poet Ignacio Gomez de Liaño sums up the beat influence by stating that what the beats have given us, meaning Spanish poets, is a chronicle an utterly sincere report of themselves. And this in the context of uh, a very repressed culture uh, comes of no surprise that Spanish poets found beat poetry uh, attractive to say the least. In sum, the beat connection in Claraboya should not be understood as a mere consequ consequence of Spain late, late opening to the world, but rather as a poetic that had much in common with any number of younger poets, uh, uh, Spanish poets at the time. Although the thematic and stylistic similarities with the beat movement started to become more explicit in the in Spanish uh, literary circles in the late 60s and mostly uh, early 70s, especially after this publication, uh, which is Antología de la Beat Generation, so Anthology of the Beat Generation, uh, if we do an analysis, an analysis of specific poets, uh, this reveals a more complicated map of both old, older and younger poets. So now I'm going to fast, uh, fast forward four years uh, to 2011, uh, because 2011 witnessed the publication of the Beatitude, Visiones de la Big Generation. So this is the attitude, visions of the Big Generation, which is a book where more than 30 Spanish poets, writers, and artists pay tribute to the American movement. In addition to being, and this is a quote from the editor, a subjective, intimate, and strictly literary tribute that openly acknowledges the influence and debt to the B generation, this anthology is also a reminder that the influence of the B generation is not restricted to poets living in the aftermath of the Civil War or even up to transitional poets, but actually extends to younger generations. The work produced by this poet, Vicente Muñoz Álvarez, gives testimony uh, of this. Indeed, a very big irony is present in the, poet, in the poet's representation of restlessness and inconformity in the poem Uno de Tantos, one among many, where the unemployed rebel to be, still living at his parents, performs his, his unconformity through the following commandments. Now I'm going to talk about a lot of poems, a lot of poets and poems, uh, and I'm, I'm gonna try something which is I'm gonna read the poems in Spanish, so you, so you get a sense of how it sounds in Spanish, and hopefully you can follow in red the translation. Let's see how it works. So this is uno de tantos, one among many. Leer a Miller, o a Bukowski, o a Kerouac. Llevar el pelo largo, sacar a pasear al perro. Follar de vez en cuando, ir a ver exposiciones, deprimirse. So this is basically uh, Alvarez's uh, representation of the beat in contemporary Spain. And as you can see, this is very, uh, it has a very ironic tone. Now, a much more dramatic tone is adopted in End of the Century Chronicles, where the young poet describes the desolation of a lost generation whose, uh, quote, sole aspiration was to endure life. Although in other works by this poet, such as Marginalidades, Marginalities, Muñoz Álvarez turns to a fictionalized discourse, his work is highly autobiographical, and the language is often colloquial and conversational. A candid portrayal of the poet's life can be found in Animales Perdidos, Lost Animals. This is the first poem in a collection under the same title, which situates the speaker in a very personal hell. No eran buenos tiempos. Me acababa de separar de mi mujer y había tenido que dejar mi casa en el campo. This private hell becomes increasingly universal through the, fragment, through the fragmentary images of decay of poems such as Sujeto de Experimentación human experimentation, where the world enumerates into a series of catastrophes, or burial, where the urban landscape turns aggressive and threatening to the individual. Six decades after Howell, 
Alvarez's vision of society is shockingly similar to the one portrayed by Ginsburg. And this is a poem, uh, part of the poem, Cola para Genocidio, which is genocide queuing. En fila india, confundidos, desilusionados, ciegos, víctimas del consumismo, del capitalismo, del desempleo. Now, in other poems yet, uh, kind of revisiting Carrack's poetics of movement, Alvarez adapts the American road of Carrack to fit his commercial route as an on-the-road shoe seller, which was his job for many years. In these poems, uh, in a disguise of sanity, as he writes, the poet combines or chronicles uh, Spain's economic crisis and, and the kind of effect uh, it has on, on someone like him and, and on a poet. And this is uh, this uh, days of root, this poem. Naufragamos, llueve, no vendemos, liquidamos, rebajamos, no podemos. Nos hundimos, esperamos, nos forzamos, declinamos, cerramos. Now this private and very nightmarish, but still very private scenario, uh, in, this, in this context, poetry becomes the only salvation, of course. Uh, even if words are a double-edged sword in some poems such as Carnivoras, and this is a poem dedicated to William Burroughs, Alvarez is plain sailing in his advice. Hold on, uh, sorry, agarra fuerte el poema, será tu salvaguarda y guía. So, like this poet, Muñoz Alvarez, Huberto Stabile, this guy here, is also interested, as he writes, in the here and now, in minimal everyday verses. This is the way he describes his own poetry. Like Muñoz Alvarez too, the poet we, we were just talking about, Stabile has been deeply influenced by the beat generation, even found in the literary magazine Aullidos, Howls, in 1993. It is indeed by design rather than by, rather than by accident that Stabile sets a poem entitled En el Camino, On the Road, as a starting point for his collected poems, Habitación Desnuda, which is this collection here. Where he, uh, and in this uh, poem, he specifically situates his work in the beat tradition, and he opens his collection with this poem. He says, Caminé en silencio tras los versos y las visiones de Ginsberg, Kerouac. Corso, Iferlinghetti. So this is the way he opens a collection. So directly addressing his debt. Now in the early poems though, uh, collected in another collection, uh, Stabile describes Spain still in transition and the same press pressure to conform expressed by the beats in the post-war American context reappears 30 years later in the context of a transitional Spain. This is a poem from, from that era, uh, which is called uh, toma 507 Apología del Terror. Practicar la castidad, cuidar las buenas costumbres, casamiento, familia y descanso, conciencia de clase, fútbol y Coca-Cola, autoconvencimiento, militancia pasiva y demagogia activa. Now, if we keep digging on his poetry, we, we find, for instance, Balada de Ángel Loco, which is this poem here. Uh, Mad Angels Ballad, something like this, uh, where the poet's hometown is filtered through beat lens uh, and turns into the play, kind of like the playground for uh, jóvenes sin causa, ebrios y locos, desheredados y melancólicos. So like a little bit like Gisenberg's uh, best minds, Stabile sets uh, a city where he finds these crazy people uh, without a cause, these um, young men without a cause, uh, to chronicle his generation, and he writes uh, that these people are hablando como locos de todo lo que nos urge cambiar, callejeando como niños, buscando gatos y asomándonos por las ventanillas de todo lo que lleva ruedas y se mueve. Now, these points that I've just talked about are but just an example of the influence the big generation has had and continues to have in Spanish-speaking points. The publication of yet another collection. Uh, this is uh, 2017. A. Jacquera, La Huella Beat en la Poesía en Lengua Española. This is Hey Jacquera, Beat Footprints in Spanish Speaking Poetry, uh, which collects Spanish and Latin American poets directly influenced by the Beat Generation, further attests to the still growing relevance of the Beat Generation across international waters. Now I'm going to talk about some of the poets included in this collection uh, to give you an idea of the kind of poems that they include here, which are not necessarily sometimes influenced, but they have more like uh, 
direct address uh, addressing of Bitcoin. So it's, it's a curious thing what you find what you find here. So one example is this Angel Pestime, uh, who honors and also appropriates uh, the bit mythos in the poem Bitnix, uh, which is this one. Kerouac escribió on the road. Ginsburg howl. Burrows the naked lunch. Caminas desnuda después del almuerzo por la cornisa de mi fiebre y no dejas de aullar. So he's on the one hand directly addressing these points and on the other hand trying to use uh, that, that influence to now create a new verse. So it's a, uh, it's a curious thing that they do. Now, on the other hand, we also have thematical revival, revival or also an updating of big themes. And this features in the work of many other poets, such as Antonio Rigo, who in the poem Beatitude, the attitude, uh, asks the following questions. ¿Quién descolgará la luna? Un mendigo a otro. Agujas en Manhattan. O, oh, ¿se amaron quiero aquí Ginsberg sobre los céspedes de Central Park? So we can also talk a little bit about the rumors of the beat generation, whether that happened or, or did not happen. So to name just another one, another point uh, in this collection, uh, in, including in, in the collection Hey Jack Harrah, we have, we have, for instance, Julia Gutierrez, who brings to like the, the work of women of the beat generation in an untitled poem in which she refers to these women as uh, the eclipsed shining of the beat generation and concludes the poem uh, with these uh, verses. La memoria miente, la historia más. Siempre estuvieron, sin embargo. And I think this is a direct uh, reference to the memoirs written by women of the Beat Generation and the idea of them using memory to uh, kind of resituate their own position in, in, the, in the generation. So just to finish, I'm going to mention one more point who was not included in, uh, in this collection, but it is, uh, but she is indeed influenced and, and says so. Uh, uh, um, uh, influenced by the generation. This is uh, Monica Caldero. Uh, and this is uh, Monica Caldero is a self-proclaimed anarcho-Buddhist uh, whose first collection, La Musica de los Planetas, The Music of Planets, offers a, 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 a contemplative look fed by the study of Tibetan, uh, Tibetan Buddhism. Thematic as well as stylistic similarities with the Vita aesthetic can be found in poems such as En la Frontera, In the Frontier. And this is a poem that is inspired by the work and life of big poet and memorist uh, Brenda Fraser. Uh, in this poem, um, what Caldera does is she, she fuses prose of the memoir with poetry in a reconfiguration of the, of the memoir, uh, Troya, Mexican memoirs. Um, this is the memoir where, uh, Brenda, in which Brenda relates how she had to escape Mexico. Uh, she talks about her years as a prostitute and the eventual loss of her daughter, who he had to, who she had to give up for adoption. So um, I'm going to read this. This is super long, but it's going to be super quick. Because uh, again, you can see you have this big text uh, at, at the beginning. And this is sort of like recreating the uh, narration of, of the memoir. But, but again, this poem is also actualizing a little bit or updating also the position of a poet who's really a contemporary poet who lives in a very different situation that Brenda had to live. And she's kind of trying to negotiate what happened to that uh, person and the, the way she feels about it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try, um, I, hope you, I hope, hope you can follow this. Voy a tirarte un puñal. Voy a darte de lleno. Te anticipo que te va a doler. Pero no voy a tener miramientos. ¿Qué te creías que iba a pasar? ¿Qué iba a ser tan fácil? ¿Qué te creías? ¿Que estaba todo bien? ¿Qué te creías? ¿Que puedes escampar los sentimientos de culpa con una habitación nueva para, una, para tu hija pintada con todos los colores del arco iris? ¿Qué te creías, hippie de mierda? Yo es lo que piensas de nuestros padres, que son unos puretas aburridos, ¿sabes? No te quito razón, pero ellos no nos abandonaron. Es una larga historia, otro día te la cuento. Ahora... Solo una náusea sin horizonte, restos de palomita, una arcada, la nata estampada de la tarta en la cara dibuja mis cicatrices, la cera de las velas se me arrastra buscando tierra seca en una mejilla y una sonrisa se me fija en el geto con spray para pintura pastel. So again, this is not exactly rewriting uh, the work, but responding to it uh, from a different perspective. So to conclude this brief and necessarily incomplete map of, of contemporary Spanish poetry, 
shows how different generations of poets have either directly or indirectly appropriated the beat aesthetic to fit the context in which they live. This represents, again, as it couldn't be otherwise, just a prologue in a story that's still being written by a younger generation of poets, such as Carlos Elias Soriano, AKA Dante Alarido, which means something like Dante Howl, and or Annalisa Maripegrum, who fused the beat ethos with slam poetry and who proved that rather than a, fashion, uh, a passing fashion, the, the influence of the beat generation has continued to grow over the years, leaving a permanent and continuing imprint in the Spanish literary map. So kind of the end, the end kind of, thank you. It does go on, the beat does go on. <laughs> Thanks for stimulus, that's awesome. Um, okay, let's move right on and hold those thoughts. Okay, so our second speaker today is uh, Thomas Sorchuk. He's assistant professor at the Faculty of Philology, University of Bialystok in Poland. He is the author of the excellent On the Road to Lost Fathers, Jack Kerouac in a Lacanian Perspective, came out in 2019 on, is it Peter Lang? Yeah. yeah. And co-edited the volume uh, Visuality and Vision in American Literature in 2014. His most recent research interests revolve around concrete poetry, intermedia, and experimental literature. And take it away, Thomas. Oh, thanks, Ben. Thanks for this introduction. Uh, thank you for having me. It's been great to, to be here. Like I, each, each single day proves to be very, uh, give me a lot of food for thought. So uh, yeah, this day will be no different, I'm sure. Uh, okay, uh, now I'll try to share um, screen. Okay, I'll try to go full mode, full screen mode. Okay, so I hope you can see the title page. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so in my paper, I want to address beat internationalism from perhaps an unusual perspective, uh, namely what I would like to see as a nexus between the beat mythos and the global dissemination of its dimensions is the field of video games. It would not be a false assertion to claim that 70 years of the global uh, legacy of beat overlap with 70 years of its pop cultural appropriations. This continuing presence of beat in film, visual culture, and popular music uh, has been thoroughly examined by scholars such as David Sterrett and Simon Warner. Yet what, I, uh, what appears to be a blank spot in the area of research is the video game market, uh, which has been always feeding on various literary phenomena. So very briefly, I'm going to contextualize beat um, in video games by outlining uh, ways and examples of beat referencing in particular works to stop at and critically evaluate one of the most interesting and perplexing cases of beat related game that is Fallout 4. Uh, and I hope to conclude with some remarks on the possible implications of video game developers ventures into the beat world. So the beats direct contribution to video game industry has been close to none but the two worlds have actually met. Mm, the moment came with William S. Burroughs' involvement in voice acting on a 1995 horror game, The Dark Eye, in which the writer lent the cold, flat tone of his voice to one of the char characters named Edwin, additionally performing Edgar Allan Poe's uh, Annabelle Lee and The Mask of the Red Death. Other beat referencing game narratives could be grouped in two categories. Uh, there have been projects which either hope to render the nature of a particular beat idiom or which referenced beat-related locations. The former type includes a once abandoned and now revived independent project called Tangiers, which has been teased as a dark Dada Barosian slash Balardian stealth game where words uh, are your weapon and shadows are your protection. As stated by the game lead, uh, game's lead developer, Alex Harvey, uh, stealth is the very point where video games and uh, mechanics and Barosian literary strategies intersect as the game would allow one to act, quote, as an agent of disruption, avoiding agents of control, unquote. It is also the spirit of Kerouac's works that has lent itself to games. The author of On the Road was among inspirations for a 2018 indie narrative adventure game developed by Dim Bulb Games and entitled Where the Water Takes like, Tastes Like Wine. The central mechanic of the game requires listening to stories and choosing which ones to retell to various drifters while traveling across the US of the 1930s. Although the game is set in the Great Depression era, it draws heavily on and is an ode to Kerouac's intense love of the land, its people, and the American experience, not least featuring a character based on Neil Cassidy. Of the latter type of beat referencing games, the 2004 Rockstar Games big-selling action-adventure hit GTA San Andreas 
appears to have taken inspiration from Kerouac's Big Sur to design uh, Raton Canyon, a location uh, situated north of Los Santos, which is based on uh, Los Angeles. As we may remember, Raton Canyon was a name Kerouac gave to Bigsby Canyon on the Big Sur coast of California, where he went to stay in Ferlinghetti's cabin to seek seclusion from fame and clamor. In the game, the location offers players some stunning views and a chance for open air activities, such as dirt biking or parachute jumping. As noted by John Wills, quote, uh, Raton Canyon provides ga provided gamers with a beautiful place to rest and admire the digital wilderness, unquote, just like Kerouac's Raton was supposed to offer seclusion to the troubled narrator of Big Sur. Thus, in GTA V, gamers can actually interact with a digitized literary space, albeit without any other reference to Kerouac's novel than a toponym. It would be tempting to delve deeper into the digital topographies of these games and further read them along the lines of Kerouac's idiom, but I would like to move on to a more perplexing instance of referencing and appropriating beat, uh, mythos by the video game industry, which is the case of Fallout 4. A winner of numerous gaming awards and a commercial hit following the success of its previous installments, Fallout 4 is a 2015 AAA action role-playing game released by Bethesda, which is set in the 2020-80s America, devastated by a nuclear catastrophe over 200 years prior. So in the game, the player takes the role of the sole survivor, either a male or a female character, who is the only person to have saved their life in a nuclear strike, thanks to having been preserved in a cryogenic pod, and who must find people responsible for the death of their spouse and locate their abducted son, Sean. The player explores the, a land named the Commonwealth, uh, which comprises parts of the Massachusetts state and renders a post-war world of disorder ravaged by wars between several groups of conflicting interests. The variety of factions and quests, as well as over 300 locations, correspond to a mosaic of references to culture and history of the US. To name but a few, the key events in the game story take place at historical sites, such as Bunker Hill, Concord, and Boston. A loosely organized civilian militia called the Commonwealth Minutemen takes one back to the historical formation of Minutemen, a part of the American colonial militia fighting in the American Revolutionary War. Another movement, the Railroad, the Railroad which is an underground liberation group uh, giving freedom to androids called Synths, alludes to the activity of the 19th century underground rail railroad. Of a dozen ventures into literature and pop culture, uh, followed four hints at as wide ranging artifacts as Edgar Allan Poe, H.P. Lovecraft, Jaws, The Wizard of Oz, and The Walking Dead. The central th uh, theme, uh, which anchors the above mentioned references and binds all the events, uh, comes with a fulfilled nuclear threat that changes America irreversibly, which is a clear reference to the unrest of the atomic age of the 1950s. The player becomes immersed in the vibe of the 1950s as early as in the exposition of the game. It opens by placing stress on the hero's nuclear family, material well being, and maintaining the standards of middle class living. The pre nuclear strike 2070s are thus the new 1950s. Uh, we are exposed to the serenity of suburban life, homogenous in its design and social composition, yet also concerned with the looming military crisis. The catastrophe that follows is a simulation of what 1950s world could have been like had the nuclear arms race escalated to full scale. And with the artifacts and design of the past not fully obliterated, the post-war world of 2287 retains much of the aesthetics of the 1950s. In some locations, the player may happen to come across jukeboxes, posters, vehicles that are reminiscent of the decade. One example comes with the banners advertising Chrysler's cherry bomb cars resembling Firebird 3 engineered by General Motors in 1959. What is more, the advertising slogan, life is a race, win, reads like a clear allusion to the burgeoning rat race and trapping American society in the mid 20th century. The beats make their way into the game as a part of a wholesale transfer of borrowings from the decade. They are referenced and stereotyped to a significant extent in two sites to be explored by the player. The first one, uh, the Atom Cats Garage, is the home to the Atom Cats, a bit stuck up but good natured gang specializing in power armor modifications. Led by Zeke, the Atom Cats identify themselves as dropouts from the Commonwealth Society and cast themselves as, quote, beacons of cool in the world of not cool, unquote. Living in the garage on the outskirts of the Commonwealth and willing to let people in on the condition that they wear a power armor and earn trust by helping with a few tasks. 
The Atom Cats exercise limited inclusiveness as a group and wish to maintain their status of alternative community, perhaps as a means to secure what they endear the most, that is authenticity. Their distinctiveness and rebelliousness are further secured by their language, which is heavily indebted to the 1950s slang. So from Zeke, the player will hear not to be a spaz, since there is a reputation to uphold. And uh, on breaking into his terminal and reading uh, diary entries, uh, they will be threatened to set their peepers elsewhere unless they want a knuckle sandwich. So a peepers, would, a peepers would refer to glasses, knuckle sandwich to a, a punch in the face. Um, unsurprisingly, the Atom Cats overuse words such as a cat, hip, daddy -o. They also dig a lot and call everyone else squares. Given their linguistic habits, as well as their look and outfit, rather than off the beats, the Atom Cats come as a rendition of the greaser subculture. Yet the beat twist comes with the discovery that they demonstrate some literary proclivities. As the player learns while exploring their quarters and finding a number of holotapes, the Atom Cats regularly hold and compete in poetry nights. So this take on the beats is evidently satirical as the poetry is terribly bad and difficultly performed. Uh, looking through information on Zeke's terminal, the player will further learn that the leader of the gang has the ambition of, the, of compiling a book of, uh, on his life and times, whose tentative title is The Legend of Zeke, a likely allusion to Carax the Duluo's legend. So summing up, the Atom Cats episode bears a rather negative set of implications for the Beats. It reinforces the Beatnik stereotype by link linking Beats to aloofness, bohemian elitism, and not least a superficial interest in art. The other trace of the Beats can be found in Sunshine Tidings Co-op, a desolate inland settlement, which dates back to the pre-war times and which used to be, quoting from an official survival guide included in the collector's edition of the game, quote, a beatnik farming co-op of cabins and trading warehouse, unquote. As we learn, a local scuttlebutt suggests that the place is haunted by its former residents, yet its only tangible inhabitant is a household maintenance robot called Professor Goodfields. The player finds out that prior to the Great War, the unit was liberated from its slavery, that is stolen from the suburban area of a nearby location by a member of the commune named Jack. A local terminal stores Jack's log entry in which he reports an, uh, the, the event to a person named Alan in the following words, quote, Dear Alan, we finally sprung a slave from the squares for our freedom farm co-op. The tin can wigged out trying to get, uh, go back to his slave of owners, so Johnny noodled it out and zonked his motivation protocols to just be. Now we call him Professor Goodfields, just digging the world as it be owing nothing to nobody, unquote. Leaving the obvious connotations of Jack and Alan aside, it is interesting to see that Fallout 4 casts these digital beats as forerunners of the already mentioned railroad, the only major faction supporting the doctrine that androids um, are entitled to freedom. However, with Jack and Alan liberating not humanoid synths, but robotic household appliance units, what cannot help but think that the beats are being mocked and satirized once again. And the final beat reference I want to bring up is to use the 1950s parlance, a, a real knuckle sandwich. Um, occasionally in between uh, game sessions, the player kills time getting familiar with loading screen hints on how to perform better in the game. And one of such hints offers a description of a drug called Daddy O, one of the rarer consumable items in the game. As we learn, quote, popular with beatniks and intellectuals before the Great War, Daddy O heightens the user's cognitive faculties, making them more alert and more able to process information. But users tend to hyper-focus on the tasks in front of them, making it awkward to interact with them." Unquote. So here again, the beat is, con beat is confined to a beatnik token, a convenient signifier of drug abuse that uh, thus following a long tradition of sensationalizing the conducts of its exponents. Uh, having said all that, it might be well claimed that beat uh, does not actually fall prey to the sneering and exploitative attitudes of Fallout 4 developers. The game could be easily castigated as a whole, were it not for a highly ironic framework it is set in. Samuel McCready identifies the work as an example of a counterfactual historical game, which reimagines the Cold War period to challenge frequently rehearsed truths about it. He builds on uh, William uh, Eurykio's wish to see historical computer games, quote, as sites to tease out the possibilities and complications of historical representations and simulations, and to claim that games by definition subvert the project of consolidation and certainty associated with historical positivism, predicated as they are on the reflexive awareness of the construction of history, unquote. 
So through a simulation of alternative past and present, the counterfactual, as asserted by McCready, demonstrates its, quote, capacity to unravel assumptions about the static nature of historical events and to reveal the tenuousness of historical trajectory, unquote. In Fallout 4, history occupies the place of an empty signifier, leaving one with, quote, an absence of any cohesive sense of what history is in the future America destroyed by nuclear war, unquote. What the player is left with in their explorations of the game's futurescapes is irony and the uncanniness of encounter remnants of the past world, specters of ideas and items that were incapable of saving the land from destruction, nor able to offer a firm sense of order. Among many, these would include the unchecked technological progress, neoliberal democracy and capitalist economies, and mass consumer culture. Beat references in Fallout 4, as I would suggest, aid in excavating a sense of spectrality of the 1950s phenomena. Mm, if, as postulated by Derrida in his theories on hauntology and clarified by Colin Davis, the specter is, quote, a deconstructive figure which makes established certainties vacillate and whose role is first and foremost to open us up to the experience of secrecy as such, unquote, while not pressing us to unshroud it, then the satirical renditions of beat and stereotypification of uh, beatnik hint as beat as a spectral presence, a phenomenon that keeps haunting us, like Jack and Alan in Sunshine Tidings, yet is impossible to be grasped with fixed categories. So if this is the case, then all the satirical undertones of the game are not really targeted at beat, but at any shallow representation of beat. In other words, every reiteration of the stereotypical image of beatnik becomes a meta-commentary on stereotyping as a misguided predilection and mechanism channeling our desperate yet ineffective retro topic attempts to cast past phenomena as fixed objects of knowledge. So here I'm referring to Zygmunt Bauman's idea of retrotopia as a nostalgic and phantasmatic perspective on things past uh, as allegedly complete, complete harmonious, orderly, uh, and thus desirable. So we can laugh off the simplistic renditions of beats and other 1950s references in the game, uh, but in the end, it is they that have the last laugh. Concluding, uh, if, Beats, uh, if David Sterrett claims that, quote, the latter day beat related movies bespeak a heightened seriousness about beats, imperfect as they are, unquote, so can be said about video games narratives such as Fallout 4. Ironic and meta referential, the discussed title proves to be quite unique among the bulk of pop cultural treatments of beat, yet at the same time, uh, it poses a risk of perpetuating beat as beatnik if approached without attuning oneself to its irony. Thank you. Wow, I just love this. I love this, the, the way we've gone beyond B into, you know, into video games. And uh, yeah, it's just really, really rich and lots, lots I want to ask you about on that one, Thomas. It's really good. Okay, let's move right on ahead. And Eric, uh, let me give you an introduction. Okay. Eric Mortensen is a literary scholar, translator, writer, and writing center consultant at Lake Michigan College in Benton Harbor, Michigan. After earning a PhD from Wayne State University in Detroit, he spent a year as Fulbright lecturer in Germany before journeying to Kosh University in Istanbul to help found their English and Comparative Literature Department. Um, Eric has published numerous journal articles and book chapters, as well as three great books, Capturing the Beat Moment, Cultural Politics and the Poetics of Presence, Ambiguous Borderlands, Shadow Imagery in Cold War American Culture, which came out in 2016, and Translating the Counterculture, the Reception of the Beat in Turkey, which was 2018. Um, Eric's also an avid translator whose work has appeared in journals such as Asymptote, Talisman, Two Lines, and he's currently uh, translating the work of uh, Nekmi Zeka for a book length project. And I think you're also working with Tony Trujillo on a project as well, Eric, right? Yeah, the Beats in the Academy, looking at how the Beats negotiate with higher education, how they reject it, but also use it or enter into it and try to subvert it from within. Oh, so great. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing more about that as well. So thank you very much, Eric, take it away. All right, um, I'm unmuted. Thanks a lot, Ben, for setting this up. Um, let me, well, I won't, for interest of time, I won't speak too much, but just jump right in. Okay, <clears throat> if countercultural literature is meant to counter a culture, what happens when another culture borrows that critique? My book, Translating the Counterculture, The Reception of the Beats in Turkey, addresses that question. 
In their own cultural moment, the Beats were seen as direct threats to both social and literary propriety. Today, the Beats might seem less iconoclastic than iconic, but their works still inspire many to question the society in which they live. Yet in Turkey, the Beats and their message of dissent have been given an afterlife. Since the 1990s, the Beats and their texts have been increasingly translated, reviewed, and discussed in mainstream academic, online, and underground forums. Although Allen Ginsberg and Peter Arlovsky were the only beat writers to actually visit the country, publishers, editors, critics, readers, and others dissatisfied with what they feel to be a more conservative trend in Turkey have turned to the beats and other countercultural forebears for alternatives. This unexpected return of beat nonconformity and protest into new cultural and temporal conditions offers a unique opportunity to rethink both the cultural logics that made the beats possible in the first place as well as the possibilities they might still hold for social, social critique in our highly globalized 21st century. Okay, so uh, here's my book, as Ben mentioned. Um, so this is, this is kind of taken from there. Um, so if you're interested, uh, the, the book kind of goes into a lot more detail than I possibly can do here. Um, so just by way of a background, um, the Beats in, in Turkey really are, you know, they're coming in the early 90s. And to understand their, their arrival, you have to understand that, you know, the, Turkey had a series of coups, military coups, the most prominent being the 1980 coup. Uh, and the 1980 coup, you know, before that, there was a lot of fighting on the le leftists, communists, on the one hand fighting, I mean, literally physically fighting in the streets and killing people uh, with conservatives and, and sort of nationalists on the right. So the military stepped in, squashed that, uh, and what they also did was kind of interesting is they um, changed economic policy, which meant an opening to the West, an economic opening to the West, but also a cultural opening to the West. So that allowed a lot more products to kind of come into Turkey. And with that influx came underground culture and the beats. And so um, you know, the beats were first, first arrived in Turkey as under, quote unquote, underground figures, which were kind of collected uh, initially in these fanzines, fanzines, um, that basically kind of presented people with like, hey, here's what's kind of hip and underground going on outside Turkey. Uh, and this is the first one, Mondo Trash. Oh, you see this is classic punk uh, anarchist sort of style in your face, borrowing very much from the UK and from the West, um, but also to some extent, including uh, Turkish variants as well. Uh, and here's another one. Um, they also came in as part of a kind of a rock and roll subculture. So the interesting thing here is that you know, oftentimes you would be reading, um, you know, you could be reading on one, you know, you're reading an article on Nirvana and then you turn the page and it's Kerouac or something, right? So it's like this mishmash because everything's coming late, sort of, uh, it, it's kind of being mashed together, which creates an interesting kind of context for the beats. And this is an, an early uh, rock, rock and roll um, culture magazine that had an issue on the beats. Uh, and this continues to some extent to the day. This is Alter Kirk Besh's um, sort of updated. It says 2040, obviously that's not correct. It's, but I can, as best I can think it's like 2008. This is sort of a, an up, updated version of that fan, fanzine kind of style, but they still publish this, right? This is still kind of coming out. It's a little retro now, but it's still out there and the beats are still prominent in it. Okay, uh, perhaps it is time to challenge and unsettle our understanding of the beats in both popular culture and academic discourse by focusing on the ways in which their texts are used, disseminated, and discussed. An examination of countercultural literature's function outside the time and place of its own production calls into question the assumptions that have accreted around beat text by exploring how meaning is contingent on local conditions and particular needs. This has important ramifications for our understanding of the beats, mired as their reception has been in the cult of personality surrounding their lives and exploits. Such an approach likewise questions the idea of a univocal beat message, arguing instead for a beat generation capable of generating numerous, if at times contradictory, messages. Beat concepts such as freedom, mobility, and the importance of the individual that may seem self-evident in a Western context, for instance, become re-articulated when deployed in Turkey, and these differences have an effect on the way in which beat texts are read. Consider, for example, how Jack Kerouac's On the Road has been received in Turkey. Kerouac's novel is well known and well respected, but often encounters resistance or bewilderment as cultural differences render some of its countercultural messages difficult to implement in the Turkish context. The celebration of personal mobility, for example, is problematic as the numerous extra textual discussions of the term hobo in the Turkish reception makes clear. 
The critic Zeynep Demersu argues, quote, maybe a term used constantly and on the road and left without translation in the Turkish version, since it implies something more than idleness or vagrancy may illuminate us, hobo. After expressing some reservations with Kerouac's novel in terms of its treatment of women, Demersu goes on to discuss what she sees as the important figure of the hobo by providing a brief history of the concept in the US. So, you know, argument is like, Turkey, this is sort of weird. I mean, you wouldn't just kind of take off, leave your family, you know, kind of directionless travel seems a bit odd. I mean, again, this, these are generalizations, but this is sort of generally true. And when I taught the novel there, you know, the students were really kind of like, Dean was really weird. I mean, why, why would he just leave? You know, why he kind of owes his family something. He, you know, he's, he has a place in the community, right? Dean doesn't, but in the Turkish context, it would be the assumption would be there's there's more of this kind of like sort of integrated kind of social world. So this leaving it would be seen as, as a real dramatic step, right? Um, another Turkish critic, Erol Bakan, claims the term resembles the older Ottoman word serguzesht or adventure, while on the road's Turkish translator, John Kantarja, does not even translate the term, preferring to add a footnote explaining that, quote, in America, this name is given to people who travel by illegally boarding trains. They have no permanent place to stay, no money, and look like beggars. They find work here and there, but there are people who consciously prefer this lifestyle. It is precisely these gaps and disjuncts where cultural translation comes to the fore that allow everyone, Turkish and Western readers alike, to think about the assumptions behind our reading. Tracking the beats outside the initial moment of their reception reveals the necessarily interested nature of cultural translation. The 2012 Burroughs uh, uh, censorship trial is a case in point. So the soft machine was actually went on trial as late as 2012 for obscenity charges in Turkey. The increased visibility of Burroughs' text is due to a dedicated group of publishers, translators, and readers who have taken it upon themselves to publicize the trial of the soft machine in order to raise awareness of both government censorship and Turkish homophobia. Through press releases, Facebook pages, book jacket blurbs, and other media outlets, supporters of the book have used the government's own words against them by publishing their statements and reports in an effort to raise awareness of the problematic nature of their claims. The ways in which Burroughs and his texts are framed for a Turkish audience sheds light on what is at stake in such appropriations. While all of those involved in the Turkish discussion of Burroughs agree that his work is important, his literary contributions are downplayed in favor of the social messages of his texts. The soft machine is important in Turkey because it opens up discussions of homosexuality and not for its innovative cut up style. Ultimately, Turkish readers, editors, translators, and others and others interested in the beats redeploy these texts in ways that are meaningful to local concerns. And that's basically my overall pitch, right? It's sort of, uh, when we look at the cultural translations, it's interesting how, how the beat, how beat travels and then how it gets used in certain ways in certain times for certain reasons, right? So if, this is the back cover of soft, the translation of Soft Machine in Turkish. And um, what you see is uh, they've taken the, a section of the, the um, the government's committee for the protection of minors uh, from harmful publications. That's the that's the government entity tasked with making sure that you know young children don't see horrible things. Um, the ones that are kind of suing to have this book uh, repressed, censored. Um, they've taken part of the that committee board's report and put it on the back of the book. Right. So um, it's part in an incitement and an enticement to the reader. Hey, you know this is sort of this book is kind of you know controversial, uh, but it's also a way of kind of drawing attention to, to the, the committee's unease or disease with homosexual depictions and Burroughs supposedly deviancy, right? And so this, this sort of uh, creates a certain, con I, I argue this creates a framework or a context for the reading of the book, right? The book, um, yeah, it's, it's a cut up trilogy. Like that's how we oftentimes talk about it. Um, it's a cut up book, but in the Turkish context, it's about homosexuality, homophobia and government censorship, right? And this, this is, um, there's several publishers involved, um, underground publishers that are kind of interested in the beats, interested in kind of presenting materials that are kind of challenging the status quo. And so they often work in, 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 uh, in tandem. So this is uh, Alter Kirk Besh again, one of their updated fanzines in the back cover. They, you know, have this, have this announcement, have this, have this back cover uh, ad, you know, Cell uh, Publishing proudly presents the quote unquote moral this um, cut up trilogy from William S. Burroughs. And again, they have this quote from the committee and a statement at the bottom, the B generation standing trial in the Turkish court. Uh, and again, drawing attention to, to, the, to this, these issues, especially the issue of homophobia in Turkish context. Okay, examining beat reception helps us to better understand how we have arrived at our present understanding of the beats 
and how we have chosen to frame their social and literary relevance. In order to conduct such an inquiry, a new approach is required. Beat scholarship has tended to focus on individual beat authors and their contributions to particularly American post-war issues. That's a general statement, but I, I think it's fairly true. But as a plethora of blogs, trade publications, Facebook pages, and online memes indicate, the beats are clearly being reproduced, and thus it makes sense to turn a scholarly eye to the ways in which the beats are re-entering the social field, both in the US and outside its borders. In order to gain a better sense of what beat texts mean to readers, we might consider employing the more quantitative methods of the social sciences, as well as, as, well as appeals to paratextual materials such as online discussions, government documents, personal interviews, and news reports. What is lacking in the field is a consideration of how exactly the beats are being read and received by contemporary audiences, right? So in order to achieve this, um, I was able to sort of surprisingly, surprisingly to my Turkish colleagues in sociology as well, uh, surprisingly able to receive a Turkish grant um, to, to uh, provide questionnaires and do focus, run focus groups and do questionnaires. Uh, for about 600 Tur Turkish readers, um, 300 of, around 300 of which identified as underground literature readers and 300 of which didn't, right? So um, I was able to kind of collect demographic information, age and some basic information, but also attitudes, cultural attitudes, social attitudes. And, and it is a means to kind of figure out how different are these underground literature readers than you know, say other readers of their own, roughly the same age. Um, and so for the, for the readers, uh, for non-readers, people that sort of didn't know about underground literature, didn't know about the beats, we also gave them a series of, of these uh, underground literature texts and then, then try to figure out, you know, like, what do they feel about them, right? You know, so questions like, this text has literary worth, this text is important for sparking debate, right? And then they tell us how much they agree or disagree with these, these statements as a way of kind of getting a sense of how these texts affect people, right? And then for, for readers, we also wanted to find out demographic information and attitudes, um, but also allowed us to, to figure out what they were reading and in what form, right? So uh, were they reading Turkish underground literature, right? The, the beats in part sparked a kind of a Turkish underground reception, uh, no, novels and other, other um, poetry and works uh, by Turkish authors who were kind of doing the same sort of thing with the beats, although not exactly the same. Um, and then, you know, did they like it? Did they not like it? Uh, did they read, it, read the beats in original or in translation, right? We have a lot of the readers were, you know, college educated uh, students, um, as you can imagine. So oftentimes they are read in the original, but not always. Uh, and, you know, did they see movies? Did they see, you know, the movie on the road? Did they read the book, right? Uh, these kinds of things. So that was kind of an important way of supplement. I mean, we oftentimes make claims about the beats um, and they're fine, you know, anecdotal claims, you know, hey, I, when I taught the when I teach this, this is how the students react, or this is my sense of what people are saying about the beats. But sometimes the sociological approach, you get a little bit of more concrete data and that, that's helpful for making kind of more concrete claims, I guess, about, about what readership might be doing. Placing the beats in a global context also provides a novel means of thinking about the importance of language in the reception of beat texts. Texts change when translated and it behooves us to pay closer attention to what happens when beat works are brought over into another language. Unfortunately, translations have thus far received scant attention in beat scholarship. There has been some work. I mean, I, that's, there has been, I've, there's a couple articles floating out there that deal with this, but there's not a ton, surprisingly. Unfortunately, translations have thus, uh, sorry, but it might be time to discuss what is at stake when a beat style that is now accepted as formally innovative becomes reformed in another language. This is not to say that the beats are untranslatable, but every translator makes choices that impact a text and its possible interpretations and that gap highlights the sort of assumptions we tend to make about the beats and their use of language. So part of the book uh, looks at um, Ginsburg translations. Ginsburg was kind of translated sort of the earliest and the most. So uh, I looked at three translations. And again, this kind of slots into this sort of pre-1980, post-1980 world. So this, this is the first translation in a leftist Marxist world where a lot of the people reading the beats or interested in the beats were also kind of avid communists. Um, unsurprisingly, Ginsburg figures prominently because he makes the most sense. His political statements get highlighted and that's what gets translated. And in fact, the first translation is actually bundled with Ferlinghetti, another writer who has a kind of a political take oftentimes. So this is, and then their faces kind of merge together. And this is, this is the first book translation um, of Ginsburg. 1991, um, you have this, this updated or this new translation by Hakan Arslan 
uh, who's who's sort of more familiar with the beats. The beats have now entered into the culture, so he can kind of be. He's more familiar with it. He's kind of he's leftist still, but he's he's more beat, right? He's living in a commune. He's reading uh, Eastern spiritual texts, that kind of a thing. So his Ginsburg is very different. His Ginsburg is very personal. It's very like hip, right? Uh, and then if you move on to the most recent 2013 version, you see that uh, Shinola Erdogan, um, no relation to the president, uh, you know, he can use, he can draw on the, uh, the City Lights series, right? Um, not everybody knows that, but people will know that the internet's now prominent, people can kind of find that out. And his Ginsburg is very like, very hip. Uh, it's very transgressive. He highlights the drug message. He actually adds stuff to the text drug related and he's also interested in spiritualizing Ginsburg um, and you know in part be, as a reaction to the, the to the government occupies a sort of you know attack on secularism trying to trying to re bring in more Islamic kind of Muslim uh, religion into the country this is sort of an attack on that and offering a kind of spiritualized you know Sufi Ginsburg right kind of a, a mystical Ginsburg and that you see that in the translation in the book I go into the details how the translations themselves, the language and the choices made highlight those, those different readings based on the moment, uh, the, the cultural moment that they're produced, right? Okay, what can we learn by exploring the reception of a countercultural moment over half a century after its inception in a culture so unlike the one that produced it? An examination of the beat's reception as underground figures in Turkey provides insight into how oppositional literature functions in the world today. Underground literature, as even its promoters are quick to concede, will not bring about an immediate sea change in Turkish culture. The question for the beats in Turkey is whether the next generation is ready for their message and how far the conservative government will go to stop it. The recent 2016 coup attempt calls into questions the parameters within which the beats can function. Does the sort of countercultural rebellion that beats offer make sense in an increasingly autocratic state such as today's Turkey or today's America, I guess, for that matter? Uh, beat works are still available, but whether they will remain a viable means of, for social resistance remains to be seen, especially given Turkey's willingness to stifle and suppress free speech in the press. The current situation in Turkey thus presents a test case for whether the beats need an open democratic society in order to function as generators of social change. The beats were used by students and dissenters to challenge autocratic rule in the post-war Soviet bloc. Can they be useful in challenging today's repressive and despotic regimes? When the Beats first burst onto the post-war scene, they were branded as rebellious outsiders who purposely transgressed social and literary standards. While the Beats' original moment of reception is past, that image has lingered. Those of us in the Academy have fought hard for acceptance, acknowledging but often downplaying Beat iconoclasm in order to recuperate the Beats in their texts as legitimate objects of literary study. This battle seems to have been won as Beat titles are now reissued as modern classics and have found their way into college syllabi and into scholarly monographs and articles. Yet it is undeniable that many readers and many critics as well consider these texts as blueprints for action. The reason the beats have remained so visible is that they offer readers a chance to rethink their relationship to the world around them, providing new models for living, thinking, and being. To understand the beats in all their complexity, we must critically examine not only how beat texts function as literary objects, but also how they enter into the social field to do cultural work. The beats and the countercultural struggle they exemplify has itself become historical. Can beat texts enter into a new present where concerns such as the struggle for freedom of expression and the right to live as one, does, one desires are still occurring? Is their critique of consumerism still applicable to the present form of capitalism? In a world dominated by identity politics, has their often problematic relationship to issues of gender, race, and sexuality invalidated their cultural critique? Is the beat insistence on presence outdated in our internet age? In sum, what fate is in store for a mid 20th century countercultural movement as it enters a new moment of reception? Renewed, renewed relevancy, nostalgic longing, or fading obscurity? Examining the Turkish reception of the beats allows us to raise these questions and in the process, begin to think about the cultural legacy of the beats in the 21st century. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, yeah, you've really helped to sort of pull together some of the threads and some of the strands that we've been uh, we've been looking at over the last three days. Um, I really like the way that 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 paper, the Turkish reception, and particularly the issues with translation, um, bring things back in terms of like reinterpretation and reinscription 
um, and that issue of appropriation that we talked about. Um, and Thomas as well, I just, I really like the way that we, we can start to think about how the beats are sort of being reinscribed again in, in video game culture, you know, and that's bringing people into contact with the beats who may, may not necessarily read them directly. Uh, and as you say, there's a sort of you know, double-sided impact of that on, on the people playing it. It's like, you know, is this, is the, is this sort of characterization good or bad? And then is there an element of it being a point of entry? And as Stivelitz as well, it's this sort of tracing of the historical um, connections between the beats and sort of Spanish history as well, which brings us back into that realm of the political um, and that sort of resistance, the, the element of, of the beats that seems to be, you know, appealing uh, to many is that, that sense of it being a, a form of resistance, which again kind of brings us back to Eric's point about the, you know, the beats being part of the academy now. You know, um, I was thinking about Nancy Grace, uh, when, when you interviewed her, Stibolitz, she mentioned about the beats being unequivocally identified as American. Um, but it made me immediately think, well, what, what America, what kind of America are they identified with here? And how is that, again, translated across borders? So enough of me talking. Um, somebody, uh, please ask one of our panelists a question or all of the panelists, please. Thomas, go ahead. Yeah, if I may, uh, thank you for, for Eric and Estebelis, thank you for your papers. Uh, they were great and I yeah, uh, was taking notes like crazy. Uh, so uh, I have a question to Estebelis, a question or a comment actually, uh, because I like, you're, actually you're reading your um, uh, performance startups to, to make me wonder like, to what extent could, could we you know, uh, think about the language, like the sound of the language? When you were reading, I tried to focus not that much on, an, uh, on the English translation, but the sound of Spanish. And like how much the prosody of Spanish somehow resonates with you know with with with, with uh, some beat themes like uh, restlessness or spontaneity. Uh, like uh, I think there are some certain like I don't know consonant clusters in Spanish, which which somehow made me think of of, of the restlessness, the theme of restlessness. So I was wondering if this might be a new point of venture for uh, for beat internationalism. Like how uh, how welcoming can uh, uh, can a particular language be to 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 certain themes like like. Yeah, Spanish or or, or French or or uh, Portuguese, uh, right? Uh, so so yeah, just a comment. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, um, I hope you could follow uh, some of it because <laughs> I speak fast when I speak in Spanish, English too. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, um, what can I say about this? Um, yeah, I think that, I think there's patterns in the sound. Some some of these points are using. I mean, I've, I've talked about a lot of points, and they're very different from each other. Um, sometimes, especially uh, for that last uh, anthology that I was mentioning, this one called "Hey Jack Harak." Sometimes the points, the points, uh, the sorry, the points you find in that collection are not necessarily beat uh, when it comes to aesthetics or style. And sometimes they can be a bit superficial because it's like, just like points that mention Karak <laughs> sometimes. But if you go to this actual work of some of those points, you do find this sound, this insistence on, on, on rhythm. And of course this gets lost many times when you, when you do translations, but I think what they were trying to do, and, and you can see this even in older generations is to uh, translate uh, the big generation into the sounds of Spanish. And it's very similar to what Karak did when he was, uh, trying to translate haiku into English. It's not exactly the same thing, but he was kind of adapting it. So I think this is similar to what we get in, in Spanish poetry. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Do you have any other questions? Can I ask one, of, uh, one for each of my fellow panelists, if that's okay? I know. Um, so for... Um, I, I was interested, and I thought it was interesting how, you know, like these, there actually are like still beat poets, right? These people have picked up on the beats and they, and they, they kind of have carried on this tradition. I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit more about the audience for that. I mean, you know, the first figure seemed to be kind of this older gentleman. And I was like, so is it, you know, is it this case that it's like, oh, well, you know, 
this, here's this older guy that was, you know, whatever baby boomer kind of dude who's, you know, his audience is sort of older, maybe they, who knew that kind of, you know, or kind of more involved in that. Um, but there's also younger people too. So, you know, I'm just interested in like, who's, is it like a range of people interested in that, you know, to listening to that kind of poetry? Um, is it certain, is certain group, are younger people more into it? Uh, so there's like that kind of question, where is that stuff being presented? Uh, you know, are they, does it get any kind of other media attention that, you know, might be interesting to kind of talk about? Um, I'd be interested to hear like the audience, the audience for the, these like proto beats or whatever like that. And for, for Tomas, I was interested in, I thought that, you know, this, this counterfactual moment I thought was fascinating, the specter of the beats being reused and like actually re repurposed. Um, it seems to me, it struck me that it's sort of the counterpoint to that was beat nostalgia, right? Like, you know, rather than, oh, the beat, I mean, there's some nostalgic because like, hey man, you know, I dig it or whatever. But for the most part, it seemed like sort of counter nostalgic, right? It was sort of like this reinfusion of this beat specter into the present. And then because of the nature of the game could be actually physically remaneuvered, right? Like you're, you're playing the character, you're making choices, right? So I didn't know if, if that is, was, helpful or of interest or, or you thought about that as a counterpoint to oftentimes what happens with the beats is this sort of nostalgia for the post-war moment that you know we kind of want to recreate or like go back to or somehow um, establish as the the er text and then you know we have to kind of like defer to that. Uh, should I go first? Um, yeah well audience um... I actually don't know a lot about who reads these things. <laughs> I might be the only one. Uh, no, I mean, especially for the older poets, I don't think they're read a lot, especially not read as beats. Um, and these are, uh, th these older poets that I was talking about, uh, this might be like the first generation that claims the beat uh, influence. Because you, you can talk about earlier influences of, of the beats, but I think they were still very um, shaken by this idea of beats being beatniks, not anything serious. So they were pretty much denying any, any sort of connection there. Uh, but those older uh, poets that I've been talking about, they do uh, claim an influence, but I don't think they're read a lot. I think you have to go to a younger generation, especially those two that I mentioned at the end that do more things with slam poetry. Those are the ones that are being read more, but definitely the big generation is um, becoming hip in Spain. I mean, the other, just the other day I was having lunch and watching the news and all of a sudden they started talking about big women. I was like, what, <laughs> what is this on the news? Why? <laughs> like that never happened. Like every time I've been saying, I'm starting the women of the big generation, the what? Of what? <laughs> uh, but yeah, there's trying to be like a market for for this uh, for this. But I think it's mostly uh, the younger uh, poets. I'm, I mean, I'm saying younger, like thirty something, even younger, twenty something. And uh, mostly they do uh, slam and they do uh, rock music as well. They have to do also with punk. Uh, so there might be a connection there with what you were saying about Turkey and this connection with rock and and punk. I don't know. But yeah, I, I should study that maybe a little bit more. Say, uh, find out who's reading this uh, this, this thing. <laughs> yeah, thanks. So. Yeah, but, um, as for my question, I was actually like for me, it's hard to tell whether like the game developers or the uh, follow developers are like nostalgic about the beat or counter nostalgic. It's it's I guess like in the eye of the beholder, in the eye of the player. Uh, yeah, I mean, my reading is like first it was like um, uh, I, I mean I thought that the game was actually uh, like um, uh, reaffirming this beatnik stereotype, but then 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 like this this whole irony was like was was uh, clear uh, more clearer to me. Uh, so it's, it's hard hard to say. I guess there are the, like mm, there are really um, various ways to 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 see this text, to see this game as a text. Uh, and uh, yeah, like to, to, to me, I guess it's it it would be like uh, um, not really a nostalgia, but but sort of a uh, uh, like I say, um, like like an ironical look uh, at, at the 1950s. Um, um, well, uh, somehow the impossibility to grasp it with with fixed categories, which again ties in with with what we are doing. I mean, we've been trying to define what 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 beat is and what it is not. Uh, so. Uh, Mm, this game is a is a is a point some, somehow a modern day point. Uh, yeah, but I'm, I'm I guess I'm not able to 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 um, clearly say if if the game is like nostalgic or counter nostalgic. Uh, yeah, that's that's I guess in, in the eyes of the of the of of, of the player. Um, 
I hope that answered uh, yeah, at least partially oh, thanks, the thanks. question. Thanks for both of you. That was great papers. Yeah, um, I want to build on that the, the point, um, and this is kind of to both Thomas and, and Estibulitz in, in a way, actually. So Estibulitz, you mentioned the poet, is it Pes Pestine? Pesti? Pestine. Pestine. And I, I wanted, his poem references sort of Kerouac and, and Burroughs directly. And you know, this, this sounds a bit trite, but is that a kind of, like fan fiction that they're doing again. You sort of mentioned the audience as well, and it's kind of the the poetry is for the poets in a way. It's kind of for it's like a closed. If it, is it is it like us as beat scholars now, right? Are we a, a closed circle kind of talking to ourselves about this? And is I mean, and is that a problem in itself? Does that in any way diminish the work? Um, and I guess to sort of follow on from that, Thomas is. Do you feel that in, in the games, this is an attempt, and I think game designers have done this a lot in the past, is also a kind of fan fiction. It's a kind of like an echoing of themes of the beat and, and a reinscription of it in terms of a kind of trying to grasp beat style as something that's cool. And uh, the word cool came out a few times um, in sort of both in, in a couple of the papers. And again, is this trying to, connected also with what, what Eric was saying, a kind of nostalgia connected with this intangible idea of cool, I guess. And I'm, I'm also, I, I watched The Social Network a few days ago as well. And I'm, I was thinking of Sean Parker mentioning like, you know, you've, you know to, to Zuckerberg, you've got cool, like you, you need to keep hold of that. And is that something that, that, that Beat has? Is, is that part of this definition? So I wonder what both of you thought about that, really. Um, yeah, so for the, um, in the case of Angel Pestime, uh, which is maybe a problem or something, maybe not a problem, an issue, or issue is also negative, right? Like something that happens uh, <laughs> in the collection, Hey, Jack Harak, because uh, they were trying to get, um, I mean, this is a collection that directly uh, states the influence of the big generation on a lot of poets. Um, so they were, I guess they were picking poems that, clearly like in your face show that uh, influence. And sometimes they um, maybe diminish that influence by saying, I'm naming these people in my poem, which is not exactly having an influence uh, of those poets. Uh, but in that case, in the case of uh, Angel Pestime, you can see in the poem that is, uh, it has a clear structure. So he uh, very clearly uh, mentions the three big names of the big generation. I mean, if you know anything about the big generation, you're gonna know, you're gonna know these three people. And you're going to know the three works he mentions. He says, Carrack wrote on the road. Ginsburg, Hal, Burroughs, the naked lunch. Okay, duh. <laughs> and then you have the other half of the poem, which is now I'm trying to, um, now I'm going to uh, like eat those works or process those works and then come up, uh, see what comes out of my poetry. It sounds very scatological. And maybe it is. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, but yeah. Um, but I think this is also related not just to a group of people being influenced by the big generation and just naming names, but also it has to do with intertextuality. And I think this was also a very big part of the original big movement. I and mean, oftentimes you see how they call each other in their works, either they address people by name or directly rewrite works by others. So this is something that was already in the big generation. I think it might have something to do with that as well. Uh, more than simply uh, saying, hey, I know Jack Harrah, he wrote on the road, which is okay, good, <laughs> uh, but yeah. All right, so if it comes to the mode of coolness, right? Uh, uh, I, I think again, follow this kind of like mocking uh, the idea of coolness uh, all way long. Uh, but I would say maybe that there are other games like the, the one I mentioned at the beginning of the paper, uh, where where uh, the water tastes like uh, tastes like wine. Uh, I, I think there maybe it, there, there, it would be like a genuine uh, attempt at at like reinscribing coolness and like trying to redefine it like now what it could mean now. With, with follow up, I guess yeah, like here it's it's. It's it's just mocking this idea, uh, um, uh, like po pointing to this uh, you know uh, superfluity of 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 a beatnik, uh, 
Um, so uh, yeah, I, I'm trying to think about other games. Uh, also, I, I, I've been like uh, I, I've searched through some forums just to to see what uh, if those beat traces are are uh, you know. Um, uh, detectable uh, among among people and uh, uh, not really, uh, but, but but still the language. Let's say the Adam cats use uh, right or or uh, like some, some, this hip language. It resonates among some of the you know uh, uh, users, forum users. They they like they even start to have a conversation uh, you know in, in the forum using this this uh, uh, you know hip language. Uh, so, but then again, like w w what the true intentions are, uh, right here, um, w whether they, they they like like it or or just again, it, it's 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 uh, an ironical use of this language. Uh, yeah, so again, it's it's hard to say. So there we come back to this idea of spectrality. So so just noticing there is some some kind of a specter, uh, but but right. Um, and, and which opens the the, like the the field of discussion, as Derrida would say, like inaugurates the scene of writing, uh, and right. But it's uh, like you can't do much about it. I mean, any attempt to turn it into 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 knowledge, into an object of knowledge, uh, like proves to to, uh, to 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 be a uh, you know uh, an abortive attempt. Uh, yeah. So that's uh, again, yeah. I'm not think, offering. <laughs> no, no. I think I think I think you're right, and I think there's something to that. Thomas, but I think you know a lot of games, um, particularly I was thinking things like uh, Bioshock as well, and others like Halo. They're so sort of meta textual, um, and you know there are some really fascinating elements. And particularly with Fallout, you know, even though you have those sort of references to the what, what they call the Atom Cats and this sort of, as you say, this <laughs> hyper beatnik sort of hideous misappropriation of, of beat that is so common hanging over the whole game is this kind of Barosian dystopian again of course you know Gibson neuromancer influenced kind of like meta dystopia that's going on that's again like that is also how you know has that sense of cool it, it's kind of that's the core of the coolness of the game I guess um, so that's really interesting but then the um, question comes if it's beat or not, like this, like like you say, the one, uh, the, the the coolness that hovers uh, ho over the game, right? Is it still beat or is it another kind of a different kind of coolness, right? Um, makes me think of Stephen Boletto's work. He, you know, that his beats a literary history or whatever, where he he talks. It's not all about this, but he talks a lot about the inside outside, right? And in their own moment, you know, the beats, they're like, all to, they're all about inside, right? Like, you know, there's us and hey, it's hip. Do you know about it? Do you know about this stuff? But at the same time, like they're pushed, they obviously want their stuff. They want to be this global phenomenon. They want to, they want to be known. So like, they want to kind of go outside. It seems the same kind of thing as Espelis and Tomas are talking about as well. Like, you know, we kind of, there's a propriety about it. Like, oh, is it, is it beat? Is it not beat? Is it my beat? Right. Um, you know, but at the same, so there's always this, push and pull, it seems like, right, between kind of like say, oh, this is what it is, this is who it is, this is, you know, this is us, but at the same time getting, trying to get outside that or people, you know, challenging that, like, no, it can be any, you know, it could be a video game, it could be a character, it doesn't necessarily even have to conform, do we just call a guy Jack Kerouac, who cares, you know, uh, it, it, why does it matter, right? Um, but it, I mean, it matters to, to a lot of people to kind of make that definition, make that line, make that border um, that then can then be crossed. One thing I just I was just thinking about in, in terms of video games and, and transnationalism, um, I wondered what you thought about Thomas about you know because in terms of authorship, of course, video games have a huge team of of designers kind of working on them sometimes, um, and of course they're you know they're distributed globally. So I wondered if you, you had anything you want to say about that. Yeah, when I came um, up with the idea of the paper, it, it, it just uh, right occurred to me that that well, this is also like beat internationalism, like the right beat as global, something global. I mean, right, the dissemination of of, of those uh, ideas, themes, wh whether they are presented in a shallow way or or in a deeper way, it's it's still like you know. Uh, dropping some beat to people uh, and 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 uh, see well uh, l looking at what what happens next. Uh, so um, yeah, m maybe this would be like a yeah some some new um, path to take, right? Uh, well, maybe a new way to see internationalism. Uh, yeah, but I don't have yeah like as for now, I don't have really any any um, any other comments than just like realizing it, it, it might also uh, like video games might also be beat internationalism, right? 
since uh, it, it has global uh, um, like well uh, it, it reaches out to so many people right all over the world so yeah I think you're right I think it's you know part of this sort of almost a homogenizing I think I, we mentioned this with the stibolits that we're we're in the process of trying to define beat but at the same time is beat is of course in define you know it's, it's not possible to define that so yeah that's interesting hey, do we have any other questions or comments or oh, Peggy yeah uh, or is there you know, just um I don't know where to start but maybe with Eric um because Eric um I just wanted to know we, we've talked a lot about I mean you've talked a lot about reception and um also about um issues of languages, of course, adding stuff in the translation, et cetera, et cetera. I was wondering um, how have uh, Turkish poets themselves um, appropriated, um, well, not much beat language or beat aesthetics, but how, um, yeah, first beat aesthetics or language, but um, how did they um, manage in the political and social context to vehicle this idea and to, to, through what form did they choose for instance poetry or the novel genre rather because um i see that when we even when established was speaking well the anthology mainly refers to poets and it's the same way in france the anthologies focus on poetry so is there also a better way to vehicle beat ideas or to reappropriate or reinvestigate these languages, this ethos, this aesthetic. Um, so yeah, that was my uh, question. So maybe this goes for Eric and this goes also for Estabilis. And then eventually, um, well, uh, after that, I have another question for Thomas. <laughs> you want me to go first or Estabilis, do you want to? So, yeah, I mean, one one unwritten paper I've been kind of milling milling over for a while is is you know the, the portability of Allen Ginsberg, right? And this long line, it's you know you found that this is the, in India the, the you know the hungry poets or whatever. I mean, mm. certain poets there, um, and this Turkish poet Kuchuk Iskender, who just recently passed away, um, is a Turkish version where you know this Ginsbergian long line is easily appropriateable it seems to me uh and he does he does that i mean he you know the, the structure he uses the structure and he also uses uh the tropes you know especially the tra this transgressor he was a you know he was a, a gay poet um who drank a lot partied you know kind of snubbed his nose at a lot of turkish customs who's ma who managed to sort of still publish and didn't get, in, get incarcerated but um you know that would be one example you know where um i think in some ways you know, it's it's like that. It's sort of that easy, right? I mean, with, with Ginsburg, I think it works because you, you know you can kind of you can imagine plugging, take your your the issues in your country and you can almost plug them in. You know, I just complete, especially with this list and this this Whit Whitmanesque enumerations. It's very easy to kind of plug plug your particular beefs into that that kind of poetic format, and that's kind of what Kuchy, not all the time, but you know, he has poems that are just they they're very much like Hal or America. Right, he just kind of borrows that exact kind of framework, line length, you know, kind of meter and everything, and just kind of talks about Turkey instead. Um, he'd be the most sort of obvious example and the one that cited the most, but it, it picks up in prose too. I mean, there's a couple Turkish writers. Um, there's a there's a female writer who who wrote a book and it mentions Kerouac, so I'm assuming she at least had, had read it. But you know, it's it's a road narrative, but you know, inverts it. It's two women go on a road narrative basically, and they start it actually heightens it and they start robbing men. They pretend to be prostitutes and rob men. And it's really highly transgressive. And it also, it also passed, you know, the, the censors um, somehow. Uh, but um, yeah, I don't really have an answer. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting uh, how people use this stuff, right? Cause sometimes it's thematic, right? Um, sometimes it's just referential, like as we talking about, some people just drop the names. Okay, that's one way. Another way is to kind of work with theme, it seems like, right? In this case with this novel, it's like, okay, let's take the road trip, like the road, you know, the, the genre, right? We'll use the genre of the road trip, but we'll, we'll, we'll kind of reinvent it for our needs. Um, and then sometimes I think it's it's almost even more direct. And so with Ginsburg, it seems like it oftentimes, I don't know, maybe people have other examples in other countries, but I know in India, I know it's in, you know, in these Indian poets, um, but in, in, in Iskander too as well, um, where it's like, it's, you know, 
how is it's like you can just take how and like kind of rework it um, for your own concerns. And I think I think that's kind of a testament to the power of it in some ways, right? I mean, it's a it's a protest. It's everybody's protest poem, right? So I mean, I guess the strategies are different depending on you know the poet poet or writer's inclination and and what you know what you want to do with it. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but I mean that's kind of what comes to mind um, when when you when, you know when I when I'm thinking about your your question. Yeah, well, um, yeah, I think that in Spain is basically what I said before. Um, it depends on many. It depends on the poet. Uh, sometimes you find this thematic connection, um, which might have to do with the themes that were uh, part of the beat uh, aesthetic. Um, sometimes you have this because they are separated by 60, 70 years. Sometimes they have this uh, personal connection to either the life of the beat poets themselves or uh, their works, like they, they're trying to uh, create poems in which they um, respond in any way to the, to the, to, to the beat work itself. But, but also stylistically, you find uh, connections like the long verse as well as Eric was saying, the musicality of the language is very present in a lot of these poets. Um, there's all the other points like Roger Wolf, um, where there's a very evident or very Burrosian um, violence of the language that is always out there. And I think in terms of what you were saying uh, later in your question, which is uh, whether there might be a better way of translating the beats uh, culturally uh, through other forms that are not, that is not poetry. It might be, maybe this is related to what Eric was asking, whether um, there's an audience for this. And in Spain, if we, if we take a look at the younger poets now being more readable, more accessible, it might actually have to do with the beats translated, tra being translated better if it's through music or through performance than through written poetry. But, but uh, I don't know. There's something to consider there. That was exactly one of the, the, the point I was wanted to up on is when e Eric was asking about the question of audience. Um, of course, it's reading audience, but now maybe we can also think of I mean, the audience of performance because, well, um, for instance, in France, well, the idea of uh, performing, of course, there were the concrete poets, the action poets that they started in the 70s, etc. But it was not as um, a tradition as it was in America. So now it's growing more and more. And um, the audience, the question of audience, so who goes uh, to these performances of poetry reading is quite large because you do not only have people who are familiar with the text or so, but that are just um, going to poetry readings or are um, familiar with a place where poetry reading is. So they're going very often and the young people people do. So they are in contact with this text. So that was a, a question that I was really interested in, this uh, question of audience and performance. And, um, and Thomas, that's my connecting question with you, because I don't know anything, I mean, nothing about video game. It's just a word that I have no clue about. Um, and uh, first I was interested in, and this is really uh, just as a curiosity, um, how did you um, uh came to that connection i mean just what brought you to that connection so that really is very simple but just um uh, out of curiosity and the second one also related to this idea of um um uh, game designer and audience and language because we were talking about this idea of cool and la the language that was uh, actually was it cool or not or but i have this also question about um do we know anything? Of course, now I understand from Ben's also comments that the word of game desire, a designer is a, quite a large one. So you might have different person. These designers might be of different ages. So, so I see Ben that tries to say something. But, so that's what. But maybe um, do you have any clue of um, how old are these people who have designed this video games or if they can identify themselves or not? Or what is their message or why did they pick up this? And then secondly, uh, also, what is the audience for these video games? And then the third thing. So I know this is quite much. But and the third is about language, because um, um, is the language sticking to what it was or is the language adaptable to today's, uh, I mean, today's, for instance, youth language, which is because we say we speak about the word cool, but 
I mean, I, I know that my 20 years old, uh, ch I mean, daughter does not use the word cool and she does not understand what that cool, I mean, she does, but not in the way we do. So it's a totally new language. So how do they receive the language? And does that, um, is it adapted or does it just connect with the beat word? Or do you see what I mean? So um, yeah, so that, those were my questions. Uh, th thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not not much of a gamer myself, I must say. I mean, I, I bought my first console like two or three years ago as a, as a, a, a treat uh, for uh, like completing my PhD uh, uh, successfully. So that was the reason. Uh, and yeah, still a great excuse like to tell your wife that you, um, you know, when you play a game, uh, like I'm doing some academic research, like right? playing Fallout, right? Uh, great excuse. Uh, I re recommend it to everybody. Uh, yeah. Uh, so how did I come across this? Uh, sim simply, I've been a fan of, of, of Fallout series. And uh, uh, yeah, like I, I, I bought Fallout 4 and, and well, there were those things there. I thought, well, why not have some critical reflection? Um, uh, over it, um, with it, right? So, so uh, it was kind of accidental, I guess. Uh, like, um, if I hadn't bought the game, I, I, I would have never, I, I guess, uh, come up with, with with the fact that it, it might be, uh, uh, you know, an object for 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 some scrutiny, academic scrutiny. And um, yeah, if it comes to designers, that, that's also yeah, a great question. Uh, I think maybe uh, the, the, like those designers, right, who, who are referencing beat more and more in those games, because it's not only Fallout, it's not only the, the games I've mentioned. Uh, I mean, I know that there has been a, uh, a Bob Dylan game, uh, like in 1995, I think it's called the uh, Highway 61 Interactive. Uh, it's, it's like a CD-ROM game. Uh, not, not sure if, if it's a game or just like a program, interactive program, but it's uh, the, 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 there is such a thing. Uh, also, uh, Life is Strange, which which I mentioned in my abstract, but I uh, um, I haven't played the game yet, so so I'm uh, I'm going to do that. And I know that there are some Robert Frank references and and uh, references to the Americans. So so that's another thing to 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 uh, I guess dig into. Uh, also, there, there has been like a Japanese game. Uh, I'm not sure if I pronounce it well, like Shin Megami. Tensei, uh, which which uh, it's also like set in future, and it uh, mm, it, it has a, a an artificial intelligent uh, intelligence unit called Burrows, but like which Burrows would that be? I'm not sure. Still, uh, maybe that would be worth uh, checking. Uh, you're right, but coming back to the to to, to designers. Um, I, I, th I think maybe uh, it, like it's it's mostly um, younger generations of people who who made those games. I mean, on, on the wave of you know uh, this hipster revival. I don't know. Maybe may, maybe that would be the reason. Um, yeah, it's, I haven't investigated uh, this yet. Uh, but, but that's that's a very interesting question. Like uh, who drops those references? Uh, so so uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to undertake some investigation here. Uh, right, and and uh, the language uh, in and, and the audience. Right, I'm I'm not sure again about the audience. I think uh, uh, I, I mean the game got both like a critical acclaim and it was it was loved by maybe okay love would be too much to say, but it was liked by by uh, uh, gamers from what you can find at, at forums. Um, so, um, but again, I I suppose there would be older players who who played you know Fallout One and, and, and Two, which were released quite a while ago. Uh, and, and maybe also this series got some fans thanks to the, the, the fourth installment. Uh, um, so again, I, I guess the, the, the spectrum is really, really wide here. Uh, um, and the language, would, would it be adaptable to youth? Uh, uh, hmm, that's, like I say, in the forums, sometimes you can, you can see people using uh, the, the, like hip phrases from, from the game, but whether it's ironical or not, I'm not sure. Uh, um, Probably not. I mean, language changes so so uh, so fast. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, I, I guess yeah. A, a word uh, uh, which is in today is, is like out. Uh, you know, tomorrow and uh, yeah. Probably um, yeah. They are they are. I mean, uh, modern day uh, audiences, youth is, is not really uh, um, taking much much fun in using the words like those hip phrases. Huh? That, that, that's my guess. So, hope I've answered. Yeah some of those questions. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Thomas. Um, does anyone else want to continue this discussion or want to add a, another question? We've got about 10 minutes remaining. Um, I think I've sent some um, invites if anybody wants to sort of join a separate chat before we get kicked out. 
Um, so you can if you if you want to. Um, does anyone have any other questions or want to kind of finish our discussion, offer some concluding points or anything about this? Um, I have a quick question. Uh, first of all, uh, congratulations to all the presenters for your fascinating papers. Um, so the question is for Eric and uh, Thibalis. Um, I was thinking about how these first beat works traveled and how they acclimated to different linguistic communities, different societies, different cultures, and how they were frequently used in authoritarian societies to make some kind of political product. So uh, more than aesthetic works, they became sort of um, political tools. And so my question is um, for Eric and for uh, Estibaliz, if uh, in Turkey or in Spain, uh, these beat works were officially censored, if you think that you were talking about societies that have uh, heteronormative tradition or a more conservative tradition. So were they ever uh, officially censored by the government, by the authorities, like they were, for example, here in Brazil? So that is the question. Thank you. Um, do you, oh, Esteliz, do you want to go first? I don't so um, as I was mentioned, this, the soft machine was, I mean, this was, you know, 2012, so it's fairly recent, right? The government, you know, they sued it, you know, they, it didn't stop the publication, but it inaugurated a court trial um, that had ramifications and all the side ramifications for um, pre-censorship for, you know, other publishing houses that might take on these kinds of controversial works because they had to wonder whether they wanted to go through a trial and get lawyers and do this whole thing. I mean, cell publishing, use it to their advantage because then that became like a way to kind of raise attention. So that's, they kind of turned it, turned the tables. Um, so that, that strategy, I think I have an article on that. It's part, it's a chapter in the book, but I've also an article in Arizona Quarterly about that, um, how that works. I mean, earlier on the, the, the fanzine culture was kind of interesting because it, it, it was sold like behind the newsstands and it was, it was sort of not given official approval. So you, you could get away with that, you know, and that's, I think part of its cachet. And I think that's um, part of what some people long for, you know, like the, in some ways the opening up, I mean, nobody wants to live in this despotic or autocratic regime, but at the same time, that kind of censorship for some people, especially in the underground world, it's kind of desirable because then it's like, oh, it's this hidden thing. And, you know, it's like, it's, it's circulated and things like that. So I think um, at the very beginning, the first translations weren't, I mean, they were just in literary journals because, and then the beats were really unknown. So they kind of escaped notice, I think. And then as, as they kind of, you know, people kind of became aware of it, became aware of it, became an issue. Uh, but, you know, um, yeah. And this fanzine culture, I think is the, the place where you had this, you know, Sami's dot basically, uh, that went on for quite some time. And I think that, that was useful as a way of disseminating this kind of resistance and kind of bring, bring awareness. Uh, and, the, and the stuff that's getting published now, the Alta Kirk Besh, that, that goes to the censor. So, you know, that part's over. Um, and it's, so it's more acceptable. Um, but, you know, and it, it's sort of arbitrary too, which is kind of funny in Turkey, because, you know, there's other books by Burroughs that just have as much sex and homosexuality, but that they didn't get picked up. So, why this book? And that's like the mysteries of these regimes sometimes where it's, there's, like you were saying in your paper, right? I mean, sometimes people, they, they don't know or they, they're told to look for this and they, don't, they see something else so they just forget it, but then the directive changes and so, or, or somebody brings it to their attention and pushes it. Um, so it's a bit arbitrary, but, you know, I think that's an interesting point too, I know. So people, these older generation really lamented this internet age because, you know, to them, that was the death of underground and underground was a place where, you know, the, the society could really be challenged. And it's like the irony is that with the proliferation of this, these texts, um, they lose force, you know, their revolutionary power is denuded because they're everywhere. Like you go online, there's all kinds of stuff and it's like, well, okay, you know, fine. Um, so yeah, and there's sort of an interesting tension there uh, wh where, you know, you kind of want, I mean, in some ways, getting the repression helps galvanize the, the, the attention and, and, and the pushback. Um, and, and so this, and we're seeing this today, right? In China, this questions of censorship and, you know, like, you know, kind of coming down on people uh, and their message. And it's sort of like, it's a, it's a difficult kind of, kind of negotiation, but for Turkey, I mean, you know, 
yeah, I mean, the book underwent a censor, you know, underwent a censorship trial in 2012. So it's, it's still, it's still a thing. Um, and, you know, it, it could still be a thing. And I think that's the government's plan is like, put it out there and be like, hey, we could do that. We're not going to do this all the time, but we could do it. So be careful, right? And that's, I think that's, that's the message. And that's kind of the, to me, in some ways, the most troubling message, because then it becomes pre-censorship and everybody's like, ooh, I don't know. Uh, you know, or maybe we should back off a little bit and, you know, and then that, that has implications. And I think that's what the government's strategies probably is. Yeah, well, and I think in Spain, uh, it's very similar to what Eric has said about Turkey. I think the, the first translations came in the late 60s, early 70s. And this is a, a time where uh, Franco was uh, very old and very droopy. So, <laughs> and they were also very marginal uh, literary magazines. So they, I think they got away with it. And also there's a, there was a time in Spain where they wanted to open up to the world. And I think they saw this kind of literature as a side effect, like, okay, well, if, if, if we want tourists, if we're opening up to the world and selling our, our, you know, our sea and our beaches and whatever, then, okay, maybe the big names will also get here. Uh, together with the tourists and their money. So it was like a, a consequence, but okay, maybe they didn't care about it, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, I, yeah, I touch upon, touched upon this, I think, um, from um, it, about what happened in China as well. I mean, Eric mentioned, mentioned the situation in China and there's sort of this anecdotal evidence about um, Ginsburg's sort of influence on some of the students in in Tiananmen Square, um, and but but also what's always amazed me is that you know there was no sort of censorship issue with with Naked Lunch, um, which is you know a crazy book compared to a book like Candy by Nian Nian, which was was publicly burned. Um, so yeah, there's these strange tensions, and again, like Eric was saying, it depends if it sort of catches the attention of the censors and that. And that can lead to lead to a text being being banned in some instances, and of course depends on the political situation more widely as well. Um, yeah, I think that I, the issue of censorship is really interesting in terms of um, the issue of danger in relation to the beats. Um, you know, we think about this. You know, I'm not going to talk about this too much, but we think about beat literature as as now being homogenized and uh, repackaged like as, as Thomas's papers talks about in, in this magazine, but in, in the video games, but in terms of like what we think about as the beats, we think of their literature as having a sense of kind of danger um, and a sense of danger that is, has broken into the mainstream and into mainstream consciousness, which makes it even more dangerous against um, you know, uh, controlling interests, I guess, if you want to uh, take a, a more sort of structural view on things. So again, I think that's a, a really, uh, an interesting way of looking at things. But anyway, enough of, enough of me talking. Um, does anyone have any other questions or comments they want to make? Um, I just, I mean, I, I want to say... Eric. So yeah, before... I had a question for Eric, but I'm not sure um, if we have time. Do we have time? I think they kick us out at about 11.30, but I, I can't guarantee. So if we do get cut off, I just wanted to say it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to everybody, listening to everybody. Um, I will follow up um, after, after the conference when I, <laughs> when I catch, catch up my thoughts and when I, when I sober up a little. <laughs> but thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, thank you all again, and, and Ben and Eric, of course, for uh, putting this up. Uh, so yeah, my question had to do with, uh, you mentioned the, the example of Burroughs being translated and them using this in the back cover, the, the, this text, um, talking about how it was being banned or something like that. And you talked about the idea of uh, this creating a context for the reading of the book. And I was thinking if this is something that you're also taking into consideration uh, in this book you're doing with Trigilio, uh, The Beats in Academia, because um, in the U.S., when the beats first uh, appeared, uh, very quickly the context of the beatnik created a context for reading, and that context might have something to do with the way the academia perceived the beat generation. So, is this changing now? I mean, now that the academia seems to be opening up to the beats, is it because the context is changing, the context for reading, because we don't see the beatnik anymore? We see beyond the beatnik. I don't know, just a, just a thought. Yeah, no, I think so. I mean, this, this framing is important, right? And I think the fact that, you know, 
initially the, the initial moment there was a social i mean a lot of people try to write it off as a sociological phenomenon right the beat the beatnik this isn't really literature it's more just a, you know kind of a social thing and i think as time went on and you know more works came out and as you know pushback it's interesting to think about the you know higher education context because you know i, th I think um yeah part of it is like a push to see them as literary not just as a sociological phenomenon i think it was partly driven you know by the beats themselves, uh, but also probably by students who, you know, were like, no, we want to, you know, we want to study this. And part of it, part of it is, a, you know, obviously a 60s move in education where uh, there's a switchover, right? You know, it's sort of a challenge from the students from below coming up and saying, well, no, we want a different university experience or we want different things taught, right? Um, and I think that that push to open things up uh, really made a difference. And along with, uh, you know, the beats themselves, I mean, Europa, for instance, I mean, you know, okay, well, we'll start a new school, right? Okay, and do what we want. Um, and De Prima, for instance, she's teaching in California, she's teaching, you know, opening classes on magic, and things like that. Um, you know, so I think, I think there's, there's several kind of pushes happening at the same time, it's kind of like, opening up higher education. What's interesting though, is like obviously it can only go so far, right? Because there's structures. Even in Europa, it has to be accredited. No one's gonna go there unless it's accredited because they're not gonna get, degrees not gonna mean anything. So so there's there's a push and a pull, right? Like where we can push and push and push, but we can't push too far because there's structures. Like Gary Snyder, right? He's teaching at Davis, you know, okay, he can do these things, but he's subject, you know, it's interesting to think of beats at a, at a I mean, you know, beats at a committee meeting, you know, beats at tenure meetings or something. I mean, but that happened, right, for people. Um, and Yig Ginsburg talks about his Brooklyn College versus his Naropa teaching, right? Because Brooklyn College, it's it's already established, and he can he can do things, but he's kind of subject to the school's regulations. Naropa, he has more more leverage. So I think that's what's interesting to me. I think for the book is this this push and pull. They want to be in the academy, um, but they want to do it on their own terms. But the, you know, there's there's a, they have to kind of negotiate uh, with with higher ed and accreditation boards and their colleagues and you know. Uh, accepted means of doing things, right? Um, and, and so, you know, but I know that's true of Beats in general, you know, we kind of see them as these outsiders, these pure rebels, but it's not really the case. And they, we know they wanted, they wanted attention, they wanted literary, you know, they wanted to publish in, you know, big presses, you know, I mean, they, they published in small presses, but they also wanted to be known. And, you know, they struggled for that. And that, that tension, that, that's what I was saying with Valetto's work, it's inside, outside, you know, they want, want to be, they're outsiders, but they also kind of want to be inside as well. And, you know, how do you, in some ways, not Ginsburg's perfect at playing that game. He can do both, right? He's publishing in small journals, but then he's also, you know, pub publishing with major presses too, right? He's kind of trying to play play both sides. And I think the the savvier beats, you know, could kind of pull it off, and it, it worked for them. I mean, it certainly it worked for Ginsburg. I think. I think you know, he's it's a success, right? He's well known. The stuff's out there. You know, he had a successful career, successful successful teaching career, as well. Um, you know, so I think th those tensions to me are what's interesting because it's never. It's never really one or the other. I mean, it's, it's that push and pull and that the strategies to negotiate these, these border kind of situations, these sort of difficult liminal situations and how, how it works and how it doesn't. I think that's kind of kind of interesting. And it has ramifications for today. You know, higher education, um, you know, is in some ways under attack. In other ways, it's this model of small col human humanistic colleges, you know, alternative schools are it's still out there in America. I don't know about abroad, but in America, you still see these schools pop up and online and these different methods and models and modalities. And, you know, so the, the issues I think that beats race in higher ed is it's still, they're still circulating, they're still relevant, I think. Yeah, thanks, Eric. I, I mean, I agree with that as well. You know, a lot of, um, I, I feel this when I, when I got the job here is, is that, yeah, people still say, what is the B generation? And a lot of the scholars here in Taiwan, they, they don't feel that there is anything of value in studying beat, beat writers or beat literature in general, really. It's, it, it seemed to be um, inferior in some way to, to what's seen as canonical literature, like I say, with perhaps the exception of Ginsburg, who started to filter in. But yeah, it's still very much seen as, as a lesser a lesser literature and not really worthy of study. So, yeah, you know, I guess that's something that we need to